What's up, y'all? Waiting for my guest to come up on here for the first art and talk show. I'm at your boy. Hold on. Charlie, what's up, bro? What's up, love? What's up, y'all? What's up, y'all? There she go. Join in. Chanel, what it do? Let's set you're going to have to request to come on. Troy, what's happening? Jesse, what's going on? Pastor Jesse, what's going on? You hit the, um, let's say you're going to hit that. You see the, the join button with those people that should be on the bottom? On there? Chanel family, Charlie family, my BBL fam, what's good? You, you see that button, uh, Lissette, to join? It won't let me add you for some reason. I don't know why it doesn't say I can't add you on there. Camera, what it do? What's up, bro? You see the button yet, uh, Lissette? You don't see the button. Uh, all right, try it from your, try and do it from your phone then. Try to come on and do it from your phone if you can. If you can't do it, because I only see the add button. I can't add you from the laptop, so try to do it from your phone. My boy, what's up, brother? How you doing, man? I seen you, I seen you at the, uh, Jamal, I seen you at the, uh, the rock, not the riot, the protest out in Orlando. I see you out there, man. Do your thing. Appreciate you, bro. Hey, Brooke. Miss Christy. What's going on? I'm just waiting for my guest, my special guest to come on so we can chop it up about racism from a different perspective, from her perspective. Oh, there we go. She, she, she coming on now. On the computer. Hey. Hey. What's up? Hey, I think I think it doesn't work on the computer on the on the on the desktop. That's why. Uh. Um, hey, what's up, bro? Okay. Yeah, yeah. So, but but um, yeah. So people just been looking at my face. I'm just talking, wasting time. <laughs> but. Uh, yeah, so this is my lovely guest. You know, she's gonna give us a whole different perspective on on racism. Y'all know how um, I am. You know, I have a whole different perspective of, of racism, of course, as a black man in this country. And you know, I don't. I I could go. I could go for days. But y'all know. Y'all know my perspective. Cause, you know, that's just kind of how I am. Um, socially, I'm always outward, outwardly spoken. But today we have a different perspective. All right. So the art and talk shows is all about. You know, I'm bringing in different people to share their perspective on, on topics, or um, you know, supporting uh, supporting their business, whatever the case may be, or whatever it is that is that they want to speak about. But for the first show, you know, I think it was very much so timely that we speak about you know racism. I think that's one of the the, the hot topics of the of the time right now. So um, I'm gonna pass the mic off to Miss Lissette. Kendrick, my boy. Um, um, as you guys chime in, if you have any questions, we're gonna, you know, go in and out to answer the questions, and we'll probably answer a majority of them at the end. 
And if we don't get to you at the end uh, vocally, then we will respond back after the video is shared um, by typing it with our fingers. So um, I'm going to hand the uh, mic off over to Miss Lissette. Go ahead and introduce yourself. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, you know, first and foremost, thanks for having me on here. I am like passionate, very passionate and, and nervous a little, you know, which is a good thing. It's good to, to be a little nervous. Um, but I'm, I'm really ready to, to just share this knowledge. So without further ado, um, you know, I'll give you a little background information on who I am. I'm uh, correctly identified as a white passing Puerto Rican woman, side gender woman. Um, and that, all those social constructs kind of, uh, encompass my point of view and being, uh, I'm going to, uh, define all of that for you. If you've never heard of white passing, um, uh, racial identity before, I'll, I'll get into that in a second, but, um, just so you know, a little bit about me, I'm a mom of a 13 year old, uh, son, He's five foot six, 100. 50 pounds solid uh, bundle of excitement and energy 24 seven. Um, <laughs> I am a dancer for 20 something years. Uh, I've studied all types of genres in the dance uh, scene. And I've taught and I've uh, traveled dancing as well. Um, I like to just mention that because I feel like a lot of the things that I learn throughout life uh, I can correlate and bring back to the dance community and, and the way I learn dance and the way we communicate through our bodies. So um, mm -hmm. I think that's important to bring up. Um, but yeah, so let's get into it, shall we? Um, I'm going, basically my goal today is to um, s initiate more of a conversation around racism from the perspective of Latinos and Hispanic community. Um, when I started a few months ago, uh, just diving into what racism is, what racism is, what anti-racism is, what white supremacy is and all that, I was looking for the perspective of Latinos. I was looking for the perspective of Hispanics and I couldn't find it. Um, you know, it's very few and far between where you see Hispanics having constructive conversation uh, regarding racism. So, um, and if, if. I didn't dig deep enough. Maybe, you know, maybe there is a few out there, but I feel like especially in the current racial climate, that kind of stuff should be in our face. Right. So when Alvin asked me to come and talk on his show, he um, he gave me the op option to choose what I wanted to talk about. And um, I had a lot of things to talk about, but I sit I sat and meditated on it for a while. And I chose this topic before the whole uh, you know, before we lost George Floyd and before all the protests started, I chose to do this basically because it was on my heart. I didn't, I had no idea that, you know, things would escalate this way over the last month or so. Um, but I'm just glad that, you know, I, I, I guess I'm brave enough <laughs> to do this. So, um, and yeah. Thank you very much for coming on. I appreciate you. Uh, thank you. <laughs> well, um, mm -hmm. Uh, I think that was all. The so, first, so, so, so first, and let, let everyone know, firstly, what does white passing, white passing Puerto Rican woman, how, what, what is that actually uh, defined as? How do you, how do you identify that? Like, how did, how, how did you lead up to that? Okay. Um, before I do that, I want to just say that I'm not an educator in racism. I'm, I do not consider myself an educator. Um, mm. I practice anti-racism, but that is a practice and it uh, takes a lot of research and, and just like yeah. self-work to get into. So I do not claim educator at all, but I am educated enough to identify these things and call them for what they are, basically. So mm -hmm. white passing is mm -hmm. basically what it what it says. I am I am not a white person, right? My hair, obviously, you can tell my brown eyes, my my tan mm -hmm. skin. I'm not a white person, um, but okay. 
in certain situations, if my skin tone is the lightest of the group skin tone, in that scenario, I'm considered white passing where the privilege, white privilege might be afforded to me. Okay. Does that make sense? Okay. It does make sense for me. Yeah, it does. Yeah. Is there anyone out there? If, if you don't understand, please comment. Okay, go yeah. Ahead. So for example, like if, um, if I'm in a room full of a more African-American people, you know, women and men, and I'm the lightest person and there's a, an authoritarian figure who is of white or white passing skin uh, race, mm -hmm. then um, the probability statistics tell me that I, I would probably be afforded advantage, whatever, whatever it is, over the races of the, of the rest of the people solely because of my lighter skin tone. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it does. It okay. makes sense. That's like in the in the back in the day when black people, the darkest blackest person would be out in the fields, and the light skinned person would be in the house. So exactly. I get what you're saying. So basically, any <laughs> person of color that mm -hmm. is not black mm -hmm. um, would fall under that type of uh, not black or not indigenous, like uh, a race. Okay. Would, would fall under that white passing category. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah. Hey, can I listen now? Actually, that was my first time ever le learning that. So thank you because uh, I didn't even know nothing about white passing uh, in the Hispanic world, in the, in the Hispanic, you know, um, sense. So for sure. Thank you. <laughs> go ahead, continue. I'm sorry. No, you're good. And, and as we go through this conversation, I want to make it important note as well to say that I am trying to not center my voice in this conversation because that is another way to perpetuate racism. Um, so mm -hmm. I'm really trying to speak from personal experience and share that, that's my point of view, so that people can have a better understanding of where people like me come from um, when it comes to race talk and just improve the conversation that way. But I'm not trying to censor my voice or censor my, my point of view at all. It makes sense. Thank you very much. Okay. So, um, yeah, I, I don't want to go into defining racism too much, but I want to bring out a, a, a point that I think is very important. A lot of people miss um, when it comes to mm. the definition of racism. A lot of people understand it as discrimination based on racial, racial prejudice, um, but mm -hmm. they're missing the, the point where it's also a power dynamic. So racism equals racial prejudice, right? The discrimination of racial prejudice plus power. Okay. Okay. And I'll, I'll elaborate the, on that. Explain a little bit more about that for me. Sure. So the power dynamic uh, dates back to the 1440s with King Henry. This this information comes from a mentor named Weez, um, Louisa Duran. She's on Instagram. So all of the information that I've been studying either comes from her or from a book called White Fragility that I, I read into. Um, but yeah, she says where uh, King Henry back in 1443 was, um, you know, in his rule, in his power, they, that was the inception, the, the justification of uh, exploiting slaves. That was the inception of race and racism. Okay. Okay. So that back when the transatlantic slave trade started, mm -hmm. the white men in power held that power, right? And brought all the slaves over. And we're talking 10 to 12 million Africans, not 10 to 1200, not 10 to 12,000, yeah. not 10 to 1200,000, 10 to 12 million Africans mm -hmm. were taken between, uh, 1440s, you know, the mid 1440s, all the way to 1800s, 17, mm. 17, 1800s. So, um, you know, that's where it starts, and it's it's really deep research. So I want everybody to, you know, I want to encourage everybody to go and do that research on the transatlantic slave trade and um, the African uh, di diaspora. 
um, you know, all of that is so rich in information. <laughs> um, right. But no, yeah. I, I always say, sorry to cut you off. I always say whenever, whenever I give out any type of research, any type of uh, citation that I do, I say do your research yourself because you know people may take it different way. You might find another thing because when I was in college, we had to have thirty citations. You know, ten different, um, thirty different authors, one same topic. So we always do do research and find different ways and how things can be altered. But uh, thank you um, for saying who the author was and, and where you did your research at. So people can fact check because that's what a lot of people are, are on these days, you know, so. But definitely, y'all do y'all research on that for sure. Um, sorry, continue. No, I think you're good. Um, but yeah, I was, what was I explaining? You were talking the, about the, the power dynamic. The, yeah, yeah, power dynamic. So basically to give a better example, um, down the line as, as America is, as the United States is uh, developing, has, having its, its presidents, the Civil War, all of this, um, all of the power is held with the white men and then distributed uh, across history. First, you see when they grant women the permission to vote, then they grant uh, slaves or the freedom to, to people that were enslaved. Then they grant, you know, all of these, these rights. They come starting from the white male perspective, the straight white male perspective. So the power dynamic. Sorry, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. Never mind. Go ahead. Go ahead. I'll wait. <laughs> so the power dynamic is important in racism because a lot of people like to say when they hear racial discrimination coming from a black person to a white person or a person of color to a white person, they say race, uh, reverse racism, right? But that's not a thing because the power dynamic doesn't re exist in reverse. Right, right. Right? I always, I always, I always was never a fan of the whole racism, reverse racism quote or term. I never was a fan yeah. of that. Well, it, it's, it's, it's a, a made up thing to right. again just perpetuate you know and and stop the conversation of uh anti-racism right. you know correct. Um, correct correct yeah so power dynamic um that's pretty much that do we have any questions or anything okay. i did see i did see a comment i did see a comment uh my good friend Aaron, he's up there in Minnesota right now. What's up, Aaron? Aaron, white passing. White passing can be seen. At, oh my lord, Jesus! I keep saying that. I know. I, I know this. This word is wrong. Acknowledgus. Uh, <laughs> I'm saying the all wrong. Analogous. I'm saying the wrong. Spell it. Anyway, spell it. A, a, a N A L O G O U S. <laughs> Two other and, forms. And and a lot. Um, <laughs> Analogous? Analogous? I don't know. <laughs> probably, probably what it is. Forms of passing, um, like hetero, heteronormative passing, gender, able, passing, ableism. Aaron is a very, Aaron is a psychologist, so he knows all those psychologist words. He's a social worker. Okay. As well. So half those words he said, I, the ableism, I never even heard of it, but Ableism yeah. is the, the discrimination against people that are disabled. Oh, ableism. Yes, yeah. thank you. Yeah. Thank you for educating me on that. No problem. But, um, but yeah, that's what he said, but that wasn't a question, though. That was, a, that was just a statement or a comment. Um, no, no okay. questions, though. I see. Cool. So, um, yeah, I think that's it for the prefaces. Um, addressing the Latin community... I wanted to just touch on the history of uh, Puerto Ricans. Oh, oh, sorry, sorry. I did see. Sorry, I did see one question. My fault. I just seen yeah. it. It said, "I like what you said about power, but what about the superiority?" Superiority. But I don't. Yes, yes. Like white superiority. What about it? I'm not sure I'm the not, question. I'm not, yeah, yeah. Um, Kareem, can you can you? Um, be a little more deep. What type of um, superiority are you talking about? Uh, so white superiority yeah, is a, Aaron, Aaron, we don't do this. It's a it's a 
symptom or like an effect of racism, right? Okay. Like, like uh, so racism is the discrimination against, uh, you know, black people or people of color from whites uh, with a power dynamic. So white superiority happens because of that. Right? Gotcha. Okay. Yeah. Correct. Kareem, uh, he said, I, he said, I suck at this. Like so you good, you good Kareem. Like <laughs> it's okay. You know, sometimes we don't know how to word our questions. Right. I, I do the same thing. It's all good. Yeah. It's Jimmy, all right. what's up? Um, so yeah. Um, sorry, back to what you were, you were about to say before the question. Um, oh, another, about, another uh, fact, you know, and I'm thinking black. about it because your friend mentions his mistake. Um, when it comes to people mm -hmm. like me or white people in general, um, speaking about racism, it's so important to acknowledge the fact that we are going to make mistakes. Right. And to just accept that, that For being sure. in this work as a white person or white passing person, you're going to make mistakes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, that's a, that's something sure. I had to accept before coming on here because, you know, it's a learning process and we're all students first. Correct. You know, being a human, I, you know, I, it's impossible not to make mistakes. So I know that this conversation, there's probably something I'm going to make a mistake on. <laughs> and I'm totally fine with somebody calling me out on that. You know, like that's that's a necessary right part on, of so. this process. Uh, mm -hmm. you know yeah, I mean? uh, Aaron. Aaron said, understanding ourselves and, and being patient ourselves is the first step. And I completely agree, Aaron. Aaron's my good friend, man. Aaron, yeah, exactly. Being patient, patient with ourselves is definitely the key. Yeah. Be honest with yourself. Um, uh, Latino history. Sorry, go ahead. You're good. So I, I watched a you documentary. Said, I, I you broke up a little bit. I was going to touch on Latino, Puerto Rican history a bit. Yeah, okay, cool. Go ahead. Okay. Um, so I, I watched a documentary by Rosie Perez, uh, a New Yorkian, <laughs> an actress in uh, American films and an activist. Um, she made a documentary maybe a decade or so ago for, uh, just outlining history for Puerto Ricans. And I learned that um, Puerto Ricans are a mixture between African, Taino, and Spaniard roots, majority, majority. We also have mixture of French, German, Irish, you know, Dutch. There's a few others in there, but majority is black, um, African, is Spaniard, and uh, Taino. So Tainos are the ones that inhabited the Caribbean and Southern America, they were in South America as well uh, before the Spanish conquistadors came over. And when the Spanish came over, they came all men and they um, took Taino women for their wives. They created what we called mestizo children. Okay, so <clears throat> now after the Spanish came over, they're um, the Taino's immune system was not equipped to handle a lot of the infections that the Spanish brought over. So between um, their immune, I guess, uh, it, deficiencies, uh, between the genocide from the Spanish and, to the Taino's and uh, warfare, we, the Taino population was, on Puerto Rico, in Puerto Rico, was down to almost like 500 people. Wow. Right? Okay. Mm -hmm. um, and then what I, what I learned from there was in the 1800s, late 1800s, the, the Taino uh, indigenous community in Puerto Rico started to create a trend where they wanted to repopulate the indigenous um uh the indigenous race right mm -hmm. okay so this is the the late 1800s we're, we're starting to repopulate in puerto rico 
at the same time is when slave, uh, when we had Abraham Lincoln do the emancipation um, and free the slave here, or the, the late 1800s. Okay, right. so around uh, the beginning, like 1920s, 1930s, is when you see Puerto Ricans start popping up in New York. Um, they, uh, I say they because I don't know exactly who, but Americans came to Puerto Rico to, to help uh, Puerto Rico gain their independence from the Spanish after the Spanish War um, there. And then uh, Puerto Ricans were taken on airplanes in beach chairs. Uh, full airplanes. Airplane. Yeah, full airplanes with beach chairs. It, uh, to New York and to New New Jersey. Okay. Right, and so 1920s, 1930s, 1950s, 40s, 50s, you see a lot of migration, Puerto Rican migration, uh, to the north and to United States. Mm -hmm. Okay. And that's where my my parents come into the picture. My parents were born in the 60s in New Jersey, New York. Okay. Shout and um, they were both born to families where uh, the the children, and my mother was one of 12, and my father was mm -hmm. one of nine, if I'm not mistaken. Mm -hmm. So they, they, they accelerated this trend of repopulating in America. Gotcha. That makes sense? Gotcha. So you. I'm we're here. Huh? Oh. I said, I got you. I'm following. I'm trying. I'm keeping up. <laughs> word, word. Keep it up. Yeah. Um, but you know, this whole time in America, they've got they've got white, they've got black, and then they've got the Native uh, Americans that they rushed out, right? And mm -hmm. now all of a sudden, Puerto Ricans are coming up, and they're like, "Well, what are you? Where are you from?" <laughs> you know, people in America had no idea Puerto Rico even existed at that time. Um. And so the Puerto Rican culture is like kind of ambiguous as far as race goes because we literally have so many thousands of different races, skin tones in within Puerto Rico. Yeah. Right? So mm -hmm. um that ambiguity that ambiguity um, was taken advantage of by the the Americans. They they uh, said, "Well, you're you're considered Spaniard. They come from Europe, so you guys sh are uh, technically white." And so, a lot of Puerto Ricans from there claim white on every document. Okay, but now there's some some Puerto Ricans who stayed educated and. Uh, uh, very s tough in their ways and uh, okay. stuck to their roots and claim black or claim other, you know, but the majority mm -hmm. from what I understand and the research that I've done claim white. Okay. And now when it comes to paper, you know, that's all they see. They don't see the person behind, you know, whatever you're filling in the document. So, when it comes to those paper documents, who's to say that we're not privileged based on that, that you know, single piece of information? Right. Right. <clears throat> gotcha. Anyway, um, the Tainos were a peaceful, humble people. Mm -hmm. Not until they were pushed up against the wall did they fight back with the, the Spaniards, and by that time, it was too late. Uh, so, so the Spaniards and Tainos were, were, were at war? Or not war, but the, the they Tainos, they, they, they welcomed them. They welcomed them in the beginning and then realized that they mm -hmm. were there to um, rape and, and, you know, just take advantage of whatever they could, uh, you know. Okay. And then, so the Americans come in and, and try to play saviors, you know, the white saviors, um, yeah. but in really just end up industrializing the, the island for military and, and agricultural purposes. 
So the island of Puerto Rico nowadays is majority poverty stricken because it's been neglected for years by the, the American government who claims us as a territory, but doesn't even allow Puerto Ricans to vote for president. To this day, Puerto Ricans cannot vote for president. If you, well, if you live on the island. Because it's, it's a part of the US, it, Puerto Rico is part of the US, correct? It's a territory, yeah. But if you right, live so on the island, you do, not, you do not have that right. That's lame. But has yeah. anyone tried, what, what have they been doing in Puerto Rico to, to change that, to change that law? Or have they been, have they really I mean, been pushing it or? No, it's crazy, you know, and it's hard for me to speak on the, the circumstances and situations in Puerto Rico because I'd never lived there, one. Um, and I only visited for a week when I did visit the island. Um, I saw the entire south side and uh, left perimeter of the island, but mm -hmm. it's not the same as actually immersing yourself in the culture. Um, but from what I did yeah. see, it, it just seems like, it, it seems like to me, uh, the people are not, they're not, uh, not, not motivated enough. They're, they're kind of content and, and comfortable where they are and, and controlled uh -huh. by the media to, to, to feel that way. Okay. Now there are there are definitely people, activists fighting. I saw a bunch of articles and videos from people that are trying to make change but not be not really being heard. Right. All right. So is that is that because they can't when they speak out they only they're only speaking out in you know, they're only speaking out in Puerto Rico and it doesn't get to the states, like it does, like the news doesn't cover them to where it goes to the states or like, like, why do you think that is? Uh, it could be, could be that, um, could be the language barrier, you know, um, there's, there's a lot of things that go into play there. The, the fact that they don't right. have the economic power to, to, to begin to speak up, you know? Right, right, right. Um, gotcha. but yeah, so. With all that being said, um, let's get to the juice of it all, shall we? Sure. Yes. <laughs> um, I wanted to talk about my personal experiences inside of racism and um, how I've personally perpetuated it uh, without knowing, subconsciously, right? Okay. Mm -hmm. So um, I guess... I can start from as a, as a kid, you know, being born and raised in Kissimmee, Florida. Um, I watched a lot of TV, you know, Saturday morning cartoons and uh, movies. And so all of that uh, subconsciously taught me that people that are darker skin hold these stereotypes of, yeah. of, uh, of, um, danger, dangerous, uh, not as intelligent, or, uh, you know, j just these things. So I understand now that I've done the work that I was socialized to believe these things about people with darker skin than me. Mm -hmm. Socialized to believe that people with darker skin than me were inferior for, for whatever reason. Does that make sense? So, um, so my father, a uh, very strong, proud Puerto Rican he was, or is, um, he insisted that he would disown me as a daughter if I dated anybody outside of my race. Your father said as that to you? As a child, yeah. As a child. Yeah. At what, at what age was that? Oh, gosh. Probably seven or eight. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> so that um yeah and i'm not alone in that i'm not the only person that's ever gone through that um, that's very very common in 
okay. Spanish households, Latin, Puerto Rican households. Um, in elementary, I was bullied for having poor girl clothes. <laughs> I was bullied by, by black girls and by women, uh, girls of color for having poor girl clothes. Um, there was a man who my father befriended, a black man, let him stay in our house for a week or so, and then he disappeared and stole some things from the house. These are all experiences that I had as, as a child that kind of, uh, in a way, um, made me, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, they they con concrete concrete ideas of of racism like they 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 solidified those ideas these experiences mm -hmm. does that make sense I got I got you yeah it, it put it put a basically kind of implanted it into your brain of what what each race is at a young age exactly percent, right? exactly between yeah. between white centered media and all these in, situations that I had in right. middle school. The, the boys, uh, when it came to black or, or Latino boys, they, they were so much more lustful than white boys were. Is that, you know what I mean? I, I don't know if it was just my part of town or if that's a common thing, um, but that yeah. also plays into the part where as an adult, I'm walking down the street and if I cross a, a black man that I don't know, a Puerto Rican man that I don't know, as opposed to a white man, mm -hmm. there is slightly more anxiety in my chest in that moment. Yeah. Solely, solely because yeah. of his race. What, do, but, why, but why do you, you still feel that, feel that way now? No, 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 no. But this is, this was okay. my truth okay. before I dug into this whole racism thing. Okay, okay, okay. Does gotcha. that make sense? No, I, so, I, I got you, yeah. Um, yeah, this is all of my experience, bef subconscious racis racism. Yeah, um, gotcha. When I was in high school, uh, I was bullied by black girls who thought my hair was uh, too curly, too bouncy. And mm -hmm. for that, I wanted straighter hair. I wanted to look like more like the white girls. I thought mm -hmm. having curly, crazy hair was animalistic. Subconsciously, those were my beliefs, you know? Yeah. Um, and, you know, looking back at it now, I realized that it was, it was those girls, they had anti-blackness in them. There was something about themselves that was hurting. And instead mm -hmm. of looking inward, they, they pointed fingers outward to make themselves look better, you know, or feel better. Yeah. Um, so I fast forward, my son, he was about three or four years old, three, yeah, probably two or three. And, um, he saw a picture for the first time of 50 cent, no shirt, chain, uh, you know, his chain, all his tattoos, all his muscles out. And my son points at the picture and he goes, ma, look, he goes, ma, look, it's a gorilla. Right. So uh, he, he he couldn't he couldn't say gorilla. So he mm. he changed the G with a B. But he. In that moment, my feeling was, oh, my gosh, I'm so glad there isn't a person of color, or a black man here because I would feel embarrassed. Right. 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 Interesting. Right. But, I okay. Mean, I feel like, you know, I feel I feel like. Well, I don't know. For me, I know when kids say that, I know that it's a societal thing. They learned it from either society or and or at home. So mm -hmm. I never really kind of like blame the kid because they're innocent, you know, like they, it's, it's a learned yeah, behavior. Yeah. So I never really at like, that, yeah. oh, it's, you know, so. At I that mean, age, they're learning their same. animals. They're learning their colors. They're right. learning, you know, all this stuff. So they're going to repeat it because it's what they're learning. That's how they learn. Right. Um, and you know when you when I think about the situation in a different perspective if that picture on the wall would have been of you know um I don't know Conor McGregor 
you know, yeah. red red hair and, and a white brolic man. And my son had said, hey, mom, look, it's Bigfoot. Or, hey, mom, look, it's, yeah. it's Chewbacca. You know, yeah. I wouldn't have the same emotional response. I wouldn't be worried if there was a white man in the room, I might feel embarrassed because that that's not a thing. Right, right. There's no ra racial stigma there. There's no taboo to call out a white man and what he might look like. Right, right. I agree. Does that make sense? So agree, the yeah. lesson there was, you know, kids are going to be kids and it's it doesn't um, doesn't have to feel any type of way when they call what they see what they see, you know, and that should be more of a reflection yeah. on some internal bias than it is on what they're seeing and what they're doing. Right, right, yeah. I think I think I think that is what what we as adults that we just have to break that stigma. Like as soon as these kids start hearing those, seeing those racial slurs or racial connotations of what you know supposedly what a black person is or a white person is, whatever the case may be, it's up to the adults, like our generation, the older brothers, older cousins, the parents to go ahead and say, nah, like, that's not the right thing to say. Like, you have to put this into perspective and then, you know, to break it down. Like, that's why I think we play a very important role on the next wave, the next generation of what happens mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. in the sense of racism like you know so i mean what i've been seeing though like i seen like a lot of the, a lot of the young kids at protests um you know and, and they're being involved in that and what's crazy is not say crazy what i learned what was there's a little girl at the protest the one here in Kissimmee, and i was painting and the little girl was just watching watch me paint and she was like hey uh and I, I was like hey what's up what's your name and she's like um, my name, I forgot what her name was actually, but it was like Julie or something. I was like, oh, my name is Julie. I was like, oh man, you know, thank you for coming out. And, and she was, she's very like, she's like, skinned like you. Um, but she was, she was half Hispanic, half Jamaican. Mm -hmm. So I was like, I was like, oh yeah. So I was like, yeah, like, are you enjoying yourself? Like, you know, what's your reason for being out here? She's like, yeah, man, I, I really just came out here because I want, I want to prove to my friends that I'm black. So I said, whoa, I said, what? What do you mean? She's like, yeah, my friends think, my friends say that I'm white because I'm like, you're not even, you're not even half black. I was like, is your mom white? She's like, my mom's Hispanic and my dad is black. So I'm like, there's no white in you. I'm like, what, what, but why are you? She's like, yeah, they always try to say that I'm white or whatever. I'm like, man, you know, you don't have to, you don't have to prove anything to your, to those, to those so-called friends. They're not even your friends. So, but it was just, you know, she was so young. She was in middle school. So it's like, I was just proud. She was, like, she was proud to hold her sign up. She was proud to be, and her parent, and that's because her parents brought her out there to say, hey, man, like, now you are black. Like, now you have, you know, be proud of what you are. So, I mean, I think, I think we're, we play a key role in that, you know, in changing oh, yeah. the racism for the next generation. Mm -hmm. But, uh, sorry, go ahead. Keep on. No, Keep you're, on. Good. you're good. <laughs> I think it's important. Um, not only not only to be aware of the conversations that we have with our kids, but to allow them to have those conversations um, right. openly without without taboo, without any negative connotations or anything like that. We need to allow their minds to explore, you know, without uh, criticizing, you know, telling them what's right and what's wrong. Right. Like, in certain situations, yeah, you're going to say. Yeah. Uh, this is going to hurt you if you do it, you know, but at the wow. end of the day is their choice. Correct, 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 correct. Right. And there's, there's age appropriate conversation for every age group. You know, that you're part. not going to tell a five-year-old about the transatlantic slave, you know, <laughs> uh, trade right. and, and all the, <laughs> the atrocities. Yeah, yeah. Understand. Exactly, but you're not going to sugarcoat a race story for a 16-year-old either, you know, because at that age, Correct. they're about to enter the adult world, and they should be well aware of, you know, what's what's ahead. Correct, 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 correct. I agree. Um, but yeah, uh, where was I? <laughs> oh, we just finished talking about Aiden. Uh, you know, my father always told me stories of when he was a child in school and being in school, the, the most 
uh, profound memory he's he's he had were mm -hmm. after school fights. After school, he would he could count on being in a fight every day, and yep. he was Where he was fighting oh. both white and black kids. White kids wanted to fight him because he wasn't white. Black kids wanted to fight him because he wasn't black. Wow. Yeah. I would never, I would never, I would never think, I thought that, you know, I thought blacks, like back in the day, you know, I thought that blacks and Hispanics would get along because they were both fighting kind of the same, or both being discriminated by white race. So that's why I always assume like blacks and Hispanics that's, would Yeah, yeah, it's interesting, but that's how anti-blackness comes into play because the power dynamic, you know, that white is right, that, that white mm. holds the, the power, um, plays a huge role in in Puerto Rican communities specifically when it comes to colorism. Um, right. So non-black people of color tend to have anti-black beliefs and, and, and thoughts um, mm. to keep themselves closer in proximity to white people. Gotcha. In the, in and, the thought and, and now is that is that because is that because it feels like they feel like it's some type of um some type of um privilege as well like they, they feel yeah. like they're closer to that exactly that, like, that's exactly what it is that's why it's really hard to have some to have conversations with people that uh understand white supremacy and uphold it because they are proud. <laughs> They are proud that they have their white privilege and they understand what it's afforded them. Yeah. You know, I always said, I always said that uh, white people are not proud to be racist, but they would be proud to show the privilege. You know what I'm saying? Cause like the race, like you don't see people walking out like, Hey, I'm racist. Like you don't see that, but they are proud to speak on other things. But in reality, it's like racism. But you don't see a proud racist like you would see a proud black person or a proud Hispanic person. I mean, like you've that. got white nationalists. They they exist, you know. <laughs> oh yeah, not a nationalist, yeah, for sure, for sure. Yeah. But like, I mean, you don't see them walking around like, hey, I'm a racist, you know, like I'm a proud racist. Like they they're not they're not proud to say that because they also know like in, in their head they know like, yeah, mm -hmm. some things I do is kinda wrong, you know what I'm saying? So they're not walking out like, yeah, I'm a proud racist because they know that. They know that psychologically, like yeah. on a society, on a social norm, that's not right. But you know, that's not that good. Hold on. Um, I did see a few comments. Hold on. Uh, hold on. Let me read a few of these comments. Uh, um, my boy Kenrick, he said, "I also believe there is a bigger issue with history, as history is taught as means." Of, of, of example and heritage to learn from the past and avoid the same mistakes. However, inadvertently implants some of those views and introduce those perspectives on some, perspectives on some level. It's hard to quantify how much of the contributing factor it is. However, this learned, this learned behavior seeps in from the media, history, and outright visual um, cues. So I agree with that, Mr. Kenrick, as well. Uh, you agree that studying history manifests history? It does. It, 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 and, and I think it, and it repeats it, too, I believe, as well. I think, I think in a way, I mean, I, I do believe that what, what, you, what you set your focus on can manifest. Um, right. But I don't think... I don't think there's a direct correlation between studying history and manifesting history. I think it's more so what, what part of history you focus, focus on and why. Um, you know, if you're studying, studying history in order to manifest something, <laughs> um, then, then you might be going down the wrong path. But if you're studying history for a better understanding, you know, uh, from a... Uh, Right, right. A this wiser knowing perspective, knowing knowing that focusing on on these things could manifest, then you know that that consciousness was will 
help in that that situation so it doesn't end up manifesting if that's my you know I what i mean yeah it's, it's definitely situational or per the person per the person yeah or but history is so necessary for us either way is so necessary um to understand why we're why? here we, you know wrong. Yeah, and we've been we've been taught wrongly, so exactly, exactly. We If we don't know the true back. history, then we can be taught anything, you know, that that the forces that be would like for us to be taught. <laughs> right. Correct. 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 Um. Yeah. So I wanna I wanna go back to. Uh, talking about my experiences because I have a list of things that I, I have experienced. I probably won't touch on all of them, but there's some that, that need to be discussed. Um, now this one instance, I, uh, I'm a bartender for 10 years. So I've worked in so many different, uh, restaurants and this restaurant that I worked at, um, was very popular. Uh, it was a basketball restaurant and, um, that's as far as the details of that restaurant we're going to go into. because I don't want to, I don't want to bring any bad blood or, or, you know what I mean? But, um, it was you. a basketball restaurant and the, mm -hmm. the employees is very diverse. It was a very diverse, um, uh, atmosphere as far as working there goes. Um, the thing that, uh, okay. huh? So when it comes to the conversation of racism no, in this restaurant, right. When it comes to the conversation of racism in this restaurant, there's a term that was very commonly used uh, called BPs. Whenever a group of black people came into the restaurant that uh, could be stereotyped as the type of people that might not tip or um, might be, Uh, looking for free food or might be just obnoxious um, that term was used mm -hmm. and it was it was common knowledge between all the employees the black employees the white employees the Spanish employees everybody knew that when you said BPs you were talking about those type of people right. and you know I just That, that's one of those things because I could tell while working the restaurant that the black people that heard these, these uh, terms and even used these terms would prefer that those terms not exist. Uh -huh. But I feel like we're peer pressured into wow. using um, or, or again with anti-blackness, um, you know, they, they might have felt internally some type of way and to make them feel better uh distance themselves from that stereotype to use this term does that make sense yeah i'll follow the the problem with that was i mean serving the restaurant i served every type of guest we had and the chances that you got a good tip or um this actual stereotype were not very it wasn't very like prominent like it happened for sure there was definitely groups of black people that came in that didn't tip or maybe they were you know extra as far as their personalities would go but it wasn't a majority type of thing to where where people were like yeah um it's not just a stereotype it's not like i coming into the conversation of this restaurant i came into it after people had already been working there for 10 15 16 years some four years some five years mm -hmm. you know these people had already been so accustomed to this type of language that i felt weird feeling that it was weird right does that make sense Yeah, like I it made you it made you I got you. Yeah, yeah. Um I tried like to just refrain and not use that, but 
in conversation, it's hard. And, you know, I'm not innocent. I I definitely used that term before knowing any better, you know, and it, it sucks. And it, it, it really, because a few of those people that I worked with, I, I love them like they were family. And to know that wow. that using that term could have caused them some type of uncomfortableness, uh, you know, some type of anything, it, it hurts. You know, and yeah. and I don't want to admit that I I was a part of that, but in not doing so, I I am perpetuating racism. Does that make sense? Yes, I do. It does make sense. Just like being silent, just like being the whole the silent part of where everyone's talking about your silence is is just like exactly. being a racist. Exactly. So, yeah, I got you. <laughs> I'll, I'll hear you. Um, we are. Oh, let me. Uh, you see, Miss Kathea. Sorry if I'm saying your name wrong, Kathea. We all create stereotypes within our own races or cultures. Yes, yeah, stereotypes is a thing. I think that mm -hmm. I think we all do that involuntarily at, at a young age because of what we're just taught and what we see. You know, it's just a stereotype. Mm -hmm. It just happens. But when you grow up, you can't break those stereotypes and break that. Just exactly. be willing to learn other people's culture and be willing to it's, learn it's other so people's. So much more. Um, it's so much more about your your acknowledgement, your awareness right. of your thought mm -hmm. processes. Correct. If you're not taking the time to step back and view your thoughts from a third person, from an objective point of view then you're not going to be able to dismantle these stereotypes, these racial bias, these racial prejudice that everybody was socialized with. Um, born and raised in America. Let me go over here. Uh, you're right, Viani. I heard what you said, Viani. No data is still data. Silence is also saying something. That's right. You are exactly. saying something about yourself. <laughs> exactly. It is. Um, it's it's not just saying something about yourself, but it's it's so dangerous to the cause, right? If if you've got a group of people out here fighting with everything that they have against racism, they're they're doing this anti-racism fight with everything they've got, and at the same time, you have people who refuse to speak up on the matter and continue to use their white privilege for for not good things. They're, we're not going to get anywhere. Right. We're not going to get anywhere because black people have been having this fight for centuries now. <laughs> Correct. It's it's at the point where. It is obvious they're not going to be able to fight. You guys aren't going to be able to fight this on your own. For sure. So that is why. Yeah, we all need to together. That's why I feel like this conversation and conversations like it are so important because, um, speaking from my point of view, my perspective, the white passing Puerto Rican, mm -hmm. we have a unique platform in that our voice is not very commonly heard on this. Okay, so the opportunity is to make moves in a positive direction. Come out from mm -hmm. under your shell and speak your truth. You know what I mean? And, sure. and if, if one person is encouraged to do so after watching this, then my, my goal is accomplished. <laughs> hey, I, I'm sure so. A lot of I'm sure since it's the first one, of course, you know, a lot of people are going to want to come on because that was the goal, really, is just to bring share my platform because I have, a, you know, a lot of followers. So I share my platform to go ahead and share everyone else's story because this is something I would never, like, if I was not doing the show, like, I would never say, yeah, I'm going to do it. Uh, I'm going to do a video or talk about white passing Puerto Rican women. Like, I could never make that statement. I could never make that topic. So that's why, like, I want to be able to bring on different people who have different perspectives and educate, not only educate me, myself, but also educate others you know, as I, as I share it. So uh, I appreciate you coming on for sure. Uh, but continue. Sorry, go ahead. <laughs> okay. 
Oh, you're good. You're good. Thank you. Um, so, you know, basically, before diving into this work, every decision that I made could have trickled down to, to racial prejudice. Where I bought my house, this, this community that I bought my house is majority Puerto Rican white, white passing people. I didn't do that on purpose, but I did tell my realtor that I prefer a safer community. And mm -hmm. uh, generally speaking, a safer community means less minority. Yeah. Right? And now what, what, did, what, what, what uh, race was your realtor? My realtor was black. Oh, wow. Interesting. Yes. My realtor was a black woman. Strong black woman. Beautiful black woman. Yeah. Um, oh, okay. Yeah. Right. <laughs> you know, the friends that I picked as a child, the friends that I picked in high school, um, those decisions were mm -hmm. based on the hierarchy of race. You know, like... If I chose in elementary school, if I chose to hang out with all the black girls, then I was stereotyped as one of the black girls, the crazy black girls. If I, if I wanted to hang out with the Latinas, then I was stereotyped as sassy Latinas. Wow. If I hung out with the white girls, then I was a normal white girl. And the fact mm -hmm. that a Spanish accent, a very tough Spanish accent, is also... Because having that accent is like an automatic uh, turn away for most for, for that have racial bias against Latin Latin people and Hispanic people. So because I don't have that accent, I don't have I don't get discriminated against based off how I sound. That makes sense. You, you ch you're chopping up a little bit. You chopping up a little bit. Um. You can you hear me? hear me now? Yeah. I can hear you. Okay. Go ahead. Okay. Cool. Right. Uh, the what was the last thing I said? The, the the friends that I pick, you know, all all based on on the prejudice, you know, and so mm -hmm. now looking back at it, I. I I don't have really strong friendships with any of the people that I chose back in, in grade school, back in middle school, back in high school. And I, I attribute that a lot to the fact that my intentions in making friends weren't true in the, to, to begin with. My intentions for making friends were to be liked. I just, I, I wanted to, I wanted people to know me. I wanted people to love me. And I figured, you know, the best way to do that was to make the best friends. Gotcha. Um, what, what, what age was that? That was like er, uh, early middle school, probably elementary school. Once I got into eighth grade, um, my, my siblings and I moved into a foster care system and where we became the white minority. So in, in, the in Kissimmee, system? Yeah, in Kissimmee, we were we were the Latin minority back in the day, and then when we went to Orlando in the foster care system, wow. we were the white minority in that in that um, group home. Um, and we were told things wow. like, "We're so glad you're here because your grade point averages accumulatively bring ours up." Me and my siblings were told things like. We're so happy you're here because it makes our our um, our establishment, our foster care facility, look better. They 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 wanted us to dress up and sing and dance for for marketing, like. <laughs> I'm not I'm not making this up. <laughs> it was crazy. You know, and I didn't you go, realize you go, you, go, you go you going in and out. Still? You, you, I Am hear, I still going? I, I can't hear how you just chop it in and out. 
Uh, are the people not being able to hear me either? I can't hear you now. It's like you okay. it's like you broke. Let me take this back real quick. Okay. I see you. How about now? Can you hear me? I can see you. Yeah, yeah it's still a little choppy, but I, I hear you and see you now. Yeah. I hear you. Okay. Um... Did you hear everything I was saying you about, about the, the GPA? Yeah, I, I, I heard up to the grade, the GPA, how they said it was better with you. Oh, they're glad that you did with your grades being so high. Got yeah, yeah. Because before we had gotten to the program, the GPA was at one point. And at, once me and my siblings came, the GPA came up. And because the GPA of the, the foster care facility went up, that means more funding for the facility. Oh, shit. I didn't know that. I didn't know that yeah. that's how that worked. Yeah. So they were like, oh, this is such wow. a good thing. And then they, um, uh, it was just, you know, it was a lot <laughs> of little things, subtle things like that. Yeah. They're like, I didn't, I had no idea that was racism. I had no idea. Right. right. Yeah. That's crazy. That's and as a kid, it. it's hard. It's hard to pinpoint what actually was a byproduct of racism and what was just because. You know, um, especially for me, because it's like I know my documents, my paperwork says I'm white. So did that? Did that mean when it came to choosing a caseworker for my case that? Um, I got the better caseworker. Did that mean that um, my guardian at litem chose me over, you know, the other kids because of my race? You know, how many things did that affect? Right? You, you, you talk a bit again. Oh, dang. I'm sorry. I, 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 it's, it's part of the, the technical difficulty with the Wi-Fi. Yeah, my bad, guys. Oh, yeah. Now you're good, but now you do. Bring, you, I heard. I heard you bring up some good points, though, with the, um, you know, how much it could have turned out differently for you if you were a different race or grade-wise. You know what I'm saying? Like it would have been completely different. And I, you know, I haven't been, I wasn't ever in foster care. I have a lot of students that are in foster care, but um, uh, yeah. So I think that, I think that, um, I think that needs to be talked about a lot. I think that's a big issue too. Foster care is everything that's going on in foster care and uh, in the social, in the social work world, social workers world. Uh, like mm -hmm. my good friend Aaron got down there. Uh, there's a lot of there's a lot of issues that go on behind that, especially with the youth that really need to be spoken about and really need to be addressed. And I think people like you who went through it, like those are the best advocates because they have the real stories and the real knowledge behind it all. You know what I'm saying? So uh, I think that could be like another. We could do another show on that another episode. I could bring you on. Man, next my entire life could be like. Your your entire show series. <laughs> for sure. For sure, for sure, for sure. But, but yeah. Um, you know, I've also experienced racism as a as a Latino person from white people. You know, um mm. when I was a kid, uh at a predominantly white dance school, um I was not invited to outings and stuff regularly like the rest of the rich, rich white girls because their parents knew that my parents probably couldn't afford whatever it was that they were they were doing as a group outside of the dance studio. Mm. Um, I was very, very fortunate. Me and my sister were fortunate to be blessed with a scholarship to attend the studio in the first place. The owners, they, they allowed us, you know, and they're, they're amazing people. They, they allowed us to, to learn and teach and be there every day after school. 
but I would hear the parents of my classmates talking about that fact, you know, just around the corner, I heard things like, well, uh, what do they think? They think that we're made of money or something. Why are, why are those girls special? I heard these conversations as a kid, you know, uh, why do they get scholarships? Why not my kid? Uh, what do they think? I, I don't have bills. I don't have responsibilities. My kids aren't good enough to get scholarships. Like I heard these conversations as a kid. And instead of, you know, understanding where that mindset comes from, because you can't do that as a kid, I would hold those conversations, go into dance class. And instead of getting the moves right, like I wanted to, I was so focused. Then I'm getting yelled at by my dance teacher for not focusing because my mind's over here and I'm, I'm crying. And then, you know, the teacher doesn't understand. I'm, I'm going through something. She thinks I'm just being disobedient and not listening, you know, and that was a serious struggle <laughs> as a kid. Why? Say why? No, no, I'll, I'll say it right. I'll say it right. Sorry. No, you're good. You're good. <laughs> um, but, you know, that, that goes to show you how early kids can develop racial prejudice and racial discrimination, you know, racial biases. I'm talking about we were, me and my sister were six, seven, eight years old when I first started noticing that these girls would segregate themselves within our, our classroom. They had their own clique. They had their own thing. Um, and because we didn't have the same social status, class status, um, we, we weren't included. So that's, that's actually more so classism. Um, but it can also tie into racism because there were majority white, white passing kids. Right, right, right. Gotcha. Yeah, I, I, I'm, that, that goes deep, man, deeper than deep. I think that got to be a whole other episode. <laughs> <laughs> but you know I just I share these experiences like I said hoping that it it maybe turns a button for somebody you know that it, that's kind of on the fence not really understanding or you know they can relate and say you know what maybe I should dig a little bit deeper into you know systemic racis racism maybe I should go and research the transatlantic slave trade a little bit more you know um, because there's so much work to do. <laughs> there's so much work. Yeah. Somebody out there that thinks um, yeah, that, think that they I know. That you what? Go ahead, go ahead. I was no, going to say, go anybody, ahead, go ahead. I'll cut you off. anybody that thinks that they know um, everything that there is to know about racism is sadly mistaken. Sociologists, psychologists, you know, they, people that study racism can study racism for a lifetime. Uh, you know, studying oppression, studying anthropology, studying so many different things, you know, um, the trauma that goes into the healing process that goes into, you know, dismantling racism and dismantling white supremacy. There's just so much, so much that can be learned. So, you know, I want to encourage people to be teachable. <laughs> yes. You know, just that's a key word. Remember to key be word. a student first always. Correct, correct, correct. I'm always I'm always a student first. I always like to learn from perspectives first. It's always good to seek understanding before trying to make somebody understand you. I always say that to people. So um hmm. I do, I do. Oh, I forgot. Okay. <clears throat> so, you know what? This is actually a great way to wrap it up. Um, my yeah. mentor, Jojo Diggs, Kate Borman, she's, uh, she's located out in Vegas. Um, just an amazing woman. She's, she's helped me so much as far as my healing process goes with my traumatic childhood and, um, you know, everything that I've, I've been through. She's helped me kind of unpack 
you know, every everything that I've held on to within the past, I've known her for mm-hmm. almost two years now. And, you know, she created okay. this, this video that's the 10 no-nos for having conversation of ra- uh, racism with black people and people of color. So if you, if, People are trying to have these conversations. There are certain things when you talk to black people, when you talk to people of color, that you should just avoid completely. Um, So we'll just go down the list of all 10 things. Number one is defensive or resistant at all. Any type of resistance or defensiveness in in this conversation is just uh, problematic. You know, um, it's important to just listen first. You know, that's number one. Listen first. Um, number two, number one, okay. defense isn't necessary against being called racist um, because racism is not a binary. So this kind of ties along with the first one, um, but it's a little bit more specific in the fact that when you are being called out on your racism, um, that defense, that uh, that reflective defense, uh, or re- yeah, reflect reflexive defense that comes up is not necessary. It I ties agree. into the personal emotion that people have with this good bad binary that they think racism is, and it's not. I consider myself a, a pretty decent mm-hmm. human being, but like I've already discussed in this conversation, I have had racism. Uh, instilled in me, and I've I've explained it to you. But I I, I consider myself a good person. I, you know, my son is smart and healthy. I live a decent life. You know, I don't I don't struggle too much, um, and I love people. <laughs> so I'm not I'm not a bad person. Yeah. But you know, when somebody calls me out on on something that I may be saying that's racist, instead of saying no, I'm not, or um, oh, you're wrong, I instead will say oh. Well, okay. Maybe I'll ask a question. How how is that coming off racist? Or can you can you help me understand? You know, if I don't understand, and if I do understand, then I just apologize. You apologize, and then you do the work to fix whatever that um, whatever that belief is that you have. You know, and and then you move forward. We don't stay stuck in the in the argument. Uh, am I racist? Am I not racist? You know that that's not productive at all. <laughs> okay, so that's number two. Defense isn't necessary when it comes to being called racist. Number three, not all white people. Um, so the response that not all white people. <laughs> uh, when you hear somebody saying white people are this, or white people do this, or blah, 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 and then you feel like you have to say, well, not all white people, that's not necessary. That's called exclusivity. You're excluding yourself from the conversation and therefore perpetuating racism. So instead, Jojo suggests that we practice responding with openness instead of rightness. So practice responding, you know, uh, with just an open mind, you know, if, if the, if the post is saying all white people, blah, 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 try to listen to that message before you deflect it because it says white people. Right. Just, just consider the message, you know, um, number four, right. insisting black people can be racist. Don't do that. <laughs> Uh, I already explained why that's not a thing. You know, reverse racism is not a thing. Um, But basically, anybody insisting that a black person can be racist needs to go and do more research and uh, dig deeper than what you find on dictionary.com and Webster because uh, where those websites will define the racial prejudice aspect of racism, they um, they do not touch the power dynamic of racism. And that's the key point that everybody misses. Uh, so that's number four. Number five is tone policing. <clears throat> Do not tone police. Okay, so that's that's when uh, we say, uh, oh, 
the way you're coming off is aggressive or you sound angry or you sound, you know, whatever, that's tone policing. And you're, what you're doing is you're telling the person that their feelings, the way that they're handling their feelings is wrong. And that's wrong. You know, who are we to say that uh, a person, uh, especially in this racism conversation, a black person, a person of color um, is not righteously angry. Who are we right. to say that? So. Who are we to tell them how right. to deal? You know, um, if something in this specific conversation that I'm having with you made you angry and you came off with a tone, I couldn't sit here and say, whoa, 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 we're live. You know, <laughs> that's so wrong. Right. You know? Um, okay, so she says, instead to understand that your way is not the way and to just, you know, give yourself some space and give that person their own space to deal with their emotions the way they will. Okay. Uh, number six is the statistics fo focus. So don't focus on to statistics when you're talking about racism. It's kind of like a, a pattern thing for white people to do and us white passing people. When we feel like we're being cornered or, or um, our beliefs are being kind of turned on edge, we run to uh, statistics to, to try to emphasize our point, you know, and that kind of stuff in this racism talk is, is not conducive um, because you're you're missing the whole compassion aspect. You know, if you're if you're listening to somebody and then you throw statistics back in their face instead of being compassionate towards their message, then it's not productive. It's problematic. Stop doing it. Um, number seven. Ask for proof or references. So don't ask uh, people of color or black people for proof of their race or their experienced racism or references um, because one, that's lazy. And two, we have a plethora of information at our fingertips in this day and age, 2020. There's, there's just no reason. It, it's, um, it's inconsiderate in this conversation of racism to ask a black person or person of color to prove that they've experienced racism or to give reference you know, of uh, any type of explanation towards it. Do your own research. Okay, that's number seven. Number eight <clears throat> is the wow factor. So a lot of people that are coming into the racism, systemic racism conversation are seeing these videos for the first time and understandably, they might be shocked. They might be surprised. But just because it's your first time maybe understanding, seeing these things, does not mean it's a black person or person of color's first time, and chances are it is not anywhere near their first time seeing these things. So instead of reacting like, wow, I can't believe, or so surprised or shocked, or oh my gosh, you know, those kinds of reactions, respond with compassion and support. Just compassion and support. That makes sense? I got you. I'm, I'm following. Um, and then number nine, don't shut down. If you're mid conversation and you're you're feeling uncomfortable and you want to run from the don't do that. Confrontation is okay and you can get through it if you just try. So it's okay to say, you know what, this is making me really uncomfortable right now and I'm not sure how to respond. That's okay. It's okay to, you know, just say how you feel, but don't leave the conversation. Don't completely shut out the conversation because it makes you uncomfortable because black people have been uncomfortable for years, for centuries. Um, that's number nine, don't shut down. Number 10, don't bring up your victimhood. <clears throat> White people, white passing people, if we're in conversation with a black, black person of people of color um, and they're, they're describing to us their own personal experiences and racism, 
and we're fortunate to be able to hear these stories, do not turn around and try to play victim in these situations. It is not the time nor the place, okay? The time and place for us to talk about our own victimhood is within our own circle. Get a group of white people together, get a group of white passing people together, and you guys can talk about your, we can talk about our experiences as, as a cohort. But black people and people of color do not need to hear those types of uh, stories in racism talk. It's, it's not necessary. Just don't do it. It's, um, it's not about you. You know, this is, this is bigger than you. <laughs> so those are top 10 no-nos for white people and white passing people from my mentor, Jojo Diggs, Kate Borman. Um, just when having conversation, you know, just consider it. And, and, and where can people find that's that's a book right that's 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 a book no it's actually it's actually a video my mentor made uh, it's like a maybe a 10 minute seven eight minute video on her instagram uh her instagram is jojo okay. dig that's j-o-j-o-d-i-g-g-s jojo digs and um it's on her igtv it's called uh the 10 no-nos for race talker or white passing white people Something like that. <laughs> nice. nice. I will make sure I'm gonna put that in the in the in the comments, uh, or make sure you put that in the comments so they can. Yeah, yeah. I'll you know, tag it. I'll tag it. Follow. <laughs> cool. 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 And uh, there's a bunch. There's a bunch of comments and questions, but I couldn't catch I them all. I didn't see them because I was so. back But uh, Just... <laughs> all right, we are definitely going to respond to those comments. I know that it's been choppy, kind of choppy going in and out from my internet, probably her internet, both choppy videos, but we are definitely going to respond to all of the comments. Um, can you see, we want, you want to scroll through a few of them and then answer I, a few I before we go or them. you just want to go ahead? Huh? Oh, here they are. You can see them on your end? Yeah, I found them. Okay. So she, there's a lot of them on there. I'm gonna let her scroll, scroll through a few and answer, respond, because some go way back to when we started in the beginning. I'm on. I'm gonna paint this tree. By the way, this tree is not done. I'll I'll do it tomorrow on the next episode. Hey, you're doing your thing. But you know what? I kind of messed up on it, so I kind of. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Listening ourselves, being patient with ourselves is the first step for sure. Make sure that people call you in rather than call you out. Yes, Aaron Kennel, thank you for that. Um, he says a comment, make sure that you're calling people in rather than calling people out. So yes, um, in, in the dance community, because that's where I can relate, um, we have what's called the call out culture, right? Hip hop community, um, street dance styles. We call each other out as a way to kind of see where where each other's at like we can battle or um if you're if your moves are taken from somewhere else i'll call you out and tell you that you're biting you know so that's that's what the call out culture is like in hip-hop and street dance styles um so when it comes to racism um instead of it looking at it as a call out like hey you're being racism racist <laughs> you're being racist um it look at it as a call in to the conversation i'm calling you on your racism so that you can do better you can change and fix whatever it is that you can do that you're doing and just make it better you know uh, going forward so that that behavior changes thank you for that aaron thank you aaron good friend good guy i'm gonna get him on the show you good guy yeah i had no idea why she said it was what she always used to do, but funny, she never used to tell me leaving it open. Oh, I'm trying to read this comment by Vianney. Leaving it open to choice, which, is, which I Vianney. never did. I was always conflicted. So she writes a comment, but she's she doesn't uh, exactly say what she's talking about. She's referring to it. So I'm just going to say thank you. Oh. <laughs> thank you for your comment, and I, I appreciate that you can can relate. Um she probably she probably wrote something before 
every part has the right. We don't have to type it. Thank you. Then it also had to do with not many people wanting to ask questions or change their ways. Yeah, um, a lot of people are, are they have that issue where it might might not be that they don't want to ask questions. They might not even know the right questions to ask. You know, um, so when us people of color and and black people are having these conversations with white white passing people. It's uh, important to remember that they are going to make mistakes. So if you have the grace and the energy in, in your heart to give, then, you know, by all means, that that's probably a better way to go about it. Um, but I'm not saying uh, you're, uh, you're not right if you feel angry or feel anything else, you know. Um, but, yeah, it's, it's important to just remember you know, we're all we're all doing this work together. And if if your friend calls themselves, um, they 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 claim anti-racism, and they you can tell that they really really want to do this work and they want to make a difference, then don't shoot shut them down when they're they're trying. You know, um, don't don't be dehumanizing. Criticizing is one thing, but dehumanizing is is not necessary and it's not pro, uh, conducive in this environment been conditioned into people the way they should perceive people without realizing what they're doing, which is building budgets. So I'm, I'm going to scroll and look for questions, like specific questions. Why is it within our own culture, it's not cool to be smartest in the room? You're whitewashed if you think differently than your peers. I never understood this. Interesting. So Kareem Bouyan. I'm wondering what culture you're referring to. Um, because he says, why is, it, why is it within our own culture? It's not cool to be the smartest in the room. And I mean, when it comes to Puerto Rican culture or American culture, which is, which is what I identify with, um, I, I can relate to not wanting to be the smartest in the room because it's kind of taboo in some certain situations some situations, depending on the audience. I think if you, if you understand that your, your surroundings, the people that you're around in the moment, they, um, they look down at intelligence in that way, then yeah, it's not cool, you know? Um, but I think that's a sign of immaturity rather than racism. See. What do you it think, was, Alvin? Uh, it was it. You, you talk, you're talking about the question that said, "Why? Why is it within our own culture? It's not cool to be smartest in the room." Yeah. You're, white, white, you're a whitewashed. Okay. Yeah. Um. It. I know in the in the in the black community. I mean, me. I was always, ironically, probably one of the smartest in the room. Like, as in, like book wise, like you know, with me having four degrees and stuff like that. So a lot of my friends, like, not my close friends. My close friends was always cool. But, like, when I was just in a group of, like, either on a football team or maybe a track team sometimes, they were clown because I'll use, like, I always use, like, sometimes educated words because I feel like you can be educated just like me. You know, I don't, I don't yeah. call nobody. I don't belittle nobody. I try to uplift people. You know what I'm saying? So if I don't, if I, if I, if, if I say something in the room of people who just are so called cool, uh, you know, and and they be like, oh, why are you wearing, why are you using them big words? Like, now nah, you lame. Like, and I'm like, well, it's not even like that. Like, I'm just trying to uplift you. So, I mean, I think I don't I don't know if it, I think that's a psychological thing where people just feel like they think you're you're talking a certain way uh, to belittle them or to think as if you're better than them, which is not never the case. Mm -hmm. But uh, I think that's just a psychological thing where they, just, they feel uncomfortable and the they feel uncomfortable. Yeah, like they just, they don't, they don't want to, especially like if I, like me coming, in, coming into circles, uh, if I'm the new person in that circle and then all of a sudden they're not the leader or they're not the, the coolest guy and whatever the person, the, 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 their persona is or whatever they think they had, um, and then the, the kind of the room shifts towards me, then 
nine times out of ten, someone's going to hate or someone's going to say, oh, now he's lame. And it's just, it's just a, I think it's just a psychological thing. But, you know, I never, I never, I never was like that. But I think that, you know, it, it involves with jealousy and involves, um, it's a psychological aspect of what they feel for themselves. Because, I mean, I never felt that way about, like when I seen that, when, back in the day when it was like the super, super, the nerdy kids that just only did their schoolwork and they didn't play sports and didn't do anything. I'm like, yo, he's going to be all right. Like, I'd be like, I used to make them like, man, man stop trying to, you know, like, he's going to be okay in life. Like, he's really going to go somewhere. And that's why I look at my kids too, my students, like, the smartest kid in class always gets made fun of, and the coolest kid in class in middle school is the the worst the, the guy the one the kid that has the worst attitude or always getting in trouble. Reputation. So I always be like, oh, why why is that? But it's like it's like I always in my class I always make the smartest kid the coolest kid. Like I always I always praise him. I make sure like man, you see how you see how. Uh, Devin's doing, Devin doing his, is doing an amazing job today. That's the coolest guy in the room. Like, you know what I'm saying? I always do that instead of like, like, I never, I never give praise to the, to the troublemaker. Like, I, I, I give him no type of attention. So, you know, I don't know. I, I think it's a psychological thing why that is in our cultural, uh, culture about, you know, being the coolest. In it. I think it's psychological. Sure. Yeah, I agree. What's up, Christina? I don't know if she's still here, but she said hi earlier. Oh, uh, yeah. It's a bunch of people that said hi. Here. <laughs> uh, I just couldn't catch them. I couldn't catch them. Wait, stereotypes. But, um, some of the questions might be to certain things you said in the beginning that I forgot. So I'm probably not, I'm not, I'll probably answer when we look back and review back on the video, not answering the comments. Yeah, that's, there's a comment here uh, from Kath, from Kath, from Kathia. <clears throat> I'm sorry, girl. Um, she says you say, you she say. experienced more racism here in Kissimmee when she first moved here 20 years ago versus South Florida uh, against Hispanics. And we were here all Mexican. We were we were all called Mexicans, but it was like a big joke with the kids and the adults. They really spoke like that. So relate there um when i was a kid growing up in in kissimmee we were definitely more um of a minority it was more uh majority white here when when i was young and as i grew up and uh, left to orlando came back then we uh hispanics were more of a majority in in kissimmee now now you know and and for the most recent years um so being being Puerto Rican and being called Mexican, um, I don't take offense because I I have Mexican friends that I absolutely adore and love. Um, so being mistaken for a Mexican is actually a compliment, you know, for me, um, because I have no negative connotation toward being Mexican. Uh, does that make sense? So a lot of people will say, uh, you know, it, if they get into an argument with me, that they, they might call me, you know, uh, Mexican, or they might call me a wetbag or something like that, and uh, I just kind of shrug it off. Or, you know, in in conversation, if I'm if I'm in a heated argument with a woman that I deem is worthy of calling Karen, chances are she will respond with Shanene, which also is not a Puerto Rican name. <laughs> so you know it, it just speaks to the ignorance that's out there you know <laughs> yeah i can't i can't speak on that because <laughs> uh i'm not hispanic <laughs> but uh <laughs> um, no nah, yeah that's 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 interesting I, I i did hear a lot about growing up i did hear a lot about um well, not growing up but when I came back to Kissimmee, I did hear a lot about the racism within Hispanic, like the different, like, you know, Cuban or Colombian or Mexican, like the different type of Spanish speaking mm -hmm. races, or I don't know what you call it. I don't know what you classify it as, but. Classify what? If you're not, like if you're Dominican or if you're Puerto Rican, or whatever, like they have hate towards, you know, each other or whatever. Each other, yes. It's, it's um, called colorism. I guess is like the best way to put it. Um, 
-hmm. within the Hispanic community. So a lot of people from Latin America will not identify mm -hmm. as Hispanic. Um, and that dates back to the transatlantic slave trade because Hispanics were known to be a uh, very, very strong force in that, uh, in the transatlantic slave trade. So to be associated with Hispanics is to be associated with slave uh, owners in slave, you know, like those, those, those type of people. And Latin America, they, they yeah. weren't like, <clears throat> so a lot of people from Latin America would say, I am Latino, not Hispanic. Um, I, however, grew up being called both. And I, I didn't realize the negative connotation until just recently towards the, the name Hispanic. Um, so I identify as both and um, I recognize the negative connotation, but I don't claim it. Um, I just, I feel like it's unnecessary to claim it. It's like a personal preference, you know? So if somebody calls me Hispanic, I'm not going to get upset, but I also recognize that Puerto Rico is Latin America, you know, like, more more so than it is um, Spain. Right. You know. Gotcha. Okay. It's, I know. I know it's interesting. Like, I know you can't tell me everything within the deepness of everything <laughs> behind it because it's a lot. But yeah. um, but no. Um, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you so much for all that education. I was educated because I didn't know nothing about my <laughs> past in Puerto Rican women. I think. One alone, women alone, just the women itself is difficult for me. So Man, we could have a whole surprised. conversation on sexism. We yeah. could, I could do a whole nother <laughs> episode on sexism I'm alone. Already, I'm already doing so. So uh, <laughs> no, definitely, you, I, I, we, we are. I'm definitely gonna have you back on next season for sure. Um, and throughout this comment, um, ladies and gentlemen. Those who were in the comments understand that we. Pro I know I probably missed a few that you said something to me or you said something to Miss uh, Lissette. But uh, we will respond in the comments after we, we share this video out there. And um, is there anything? Make, first off, make sure you go follow her. Go ahead and follow her right now. Um, and tell oh, them let the me mention, is where you're missing. Let me mention, uh, this Saturday, I was asked to... Uh, join a panel discussion for um, Latinos. So it's going to be nice. a panel discussion online, live, uh, based around, the discussion is going to be based around racism, but from a Latino's perspective, mm. and there's going to be all different type of perspective on the panel. So I represent white passing side gender women, and there will be transgender black mm. women. There will be, you know, all, uh, an Asian and, you know, it's a different, a very diverse uh, panel. So I'm really excited about that. Make sure you guys tune in. It's at 3 o'clock on Tuesday. And I'll post the yes. flyer on, on the, the comments. Or not Tuesday, Saturday. Yes, post that. Please post that. Post in the comments. All right. Make sure. Anything, so anything. Oh, your IG, me. your IG. You put your IG in there, too. She's I will, yeah, I will. Thanks for tuning in, guys. Cool. I, I appreciate it. Appreciate the support. And uh, go do your homework. <laughs> <laughs> yes, do your research for sure. All right. So be blessed, everyone. I'll see y'all tomorrow. I got another show tomorrow. So see y'all tomorrow. All right. Later. See ya.